There must have been times in your life when you've wondered whether morality was real. Are we all just playing some kind of game when we say that something is wrong? There's no rule written in the sky that says that murder, for instance, is wrong, right? Moral truths aren't really true in the way that scientific truths are, right? I myself have been tempted by this line of thought, especially when I was a teenager. I just couldn't see where moral facts and moral rules could come from, such that certain actions would be objectively and universally morally wrong. I didn't believe in God at the time, and I wouldn't have called it divine command theory back then. But that idea, the idea that God is the ultimate source of morality, would have been, I think, suspect to me too. How could God make homosexuality, for instance, wrong just by commanding it? I just didn't see it. So I went on as a teenager, believing that all discussion or talk about right and wrong was just nonsense. And I might add, I probably used this line of thinking to prevent myself from feeling guilty about doing some pretty bad things in the past. But that's another matter. This is a philosophy lecture, not my biography. It's my goal in this video to argue passionately and compellingly against this kind of thinking, against these kinds of views, that the, the kind of thinking that tempted me once, especially as a teenager. I now think that these views in this line of thinking is false and dangerous. I hope to convince you of my position by the end of this lecture, but obviously it's okay if I don't. This is philosophy, after all. So let's get to it. Let's take a careful philosophical look at the demerits of this kind of thinking. So first, it's important to get very clear on just what kinds of views we're talking about. We might call the general category into which they fall non-objectivist views about morality, since they hold that morality is either wholly subjective or alternatively wholly unreal. Here are the names of the views that would encapsulate my previous teenage worries. They're called moral relativism and moral nihilism. I'll discuss each of these views in turn and hopefully refute them for you. So moral relativism holds that moral truths, in order to be truths at all, depend on someone's or some group's subjectivity. That is, they depend on the judgments, specifically the subjective judgments, preferences, or attitudes, which are all subjective mental states, of an individual or a group, like, for instance, my grandfather, who's an individual, or Americans, who are a cultural group. So let's look at an example to make things a bit clearer. Most modern liberal Democrats believe that abortion is morally permissible or morally acceptable. So for that cultural group, cultural moral relativism, that is the specific kind of relativism that makes moral truths depend on a group or a culture, it says that for that group, that is for liberal Democrats, abortion is in fact morally permissible or morally acceptable. 
But for other cultures, like modern conservative Republicans, abortion would be wrong, says relativism. Relativism says that it's wrong for them because they believe it to be wrong. They judge it to be wrong. And so for that cultural group, it is wrong. So relativism, you see, forces us to qualify a moral statement with a for them or a for him or for her clause. Since moral truths require a group or an individual's subjective judgments or beliefs or attitudes for those truths to be true in the first place. Without those kinds of attitudes making the moral truths true, then those kind of statements just wouldn't be true at all. They depend on the subjective attitudes, beliefs, preferences of the group or the individual. And so it's important to keep in mind that moral relativism can come in either of these varieties, that is the cultural or the group variety, where the truths are dependent on a group or a culture, or the individualized variety, where the truths are dependent on an individual's judgments. I'm going to discuss mostly the, the cultural form of relativism, because I think that's a bit more common, but just note that it can come in either of those varieties. One reflection that tends to motivate the line of reasoning that brings us into relativism is the idea that different cultures do things very differently. For instance, check this out. It feels like a good time to ask more about their cannibalistic past. <laughs> Have you eaten human meat? Did it taste as good as pig? So he's eaten one man, one man, and one woman. One woman. Is there any difference between the taste of a man and a woman? Is cannibalism immoral? It certainly feels very icky to me. But some cultures believe that eating the flesh of their dead is a way of honoring them. So maybe it's good for them, but bad for me or bad for Americans. Relativism saves the day, right? Well, that doesn't seem to be quite right because even though different cultures disagree about questions like this, it doesn't follow that there's no fact of the matter about it. People, for instance, disagree about the shape of the earth, but it doesn't follow logically from that disagreement that the shape of the earth is therefore relative. That would just be a logical mistake, an instance of bad reasoning. Again, disagreeing about something doesn't mean that that thing, the truth about it, is relative. And I believe that this applies to the line of thinking that often leads people into relativism. People may disagree very often about morality, but that doesn't mean it's relative. Morality just could be like the shape of the earth, where people disagree about it, but one side's right and one side's wrong. Now, let's look at a more serious problem for relativism. 
if we apply it to other kinds of cases, cases other than cannibalism, that is, we get some even more unsavory results. That is, relativism seems to threaten some basic assumptions that we often make at the very core of our way of living. Not only do I think relativism is false, but I think it's also dangerous, and exposing the way in which it's dangerous will help bring out the basic assumptions that we make every day that relativism seems to really undercut or go up against. So according to relativism, what's right for one group could be wrong for another. That's just the basic thesis. So even though most of society believes that it's wrong to drink and drive, it's not wrong for reckless teenagers to drink and drive, since it's part of their reckless teenage culture to do so. So this brings us to our first major objection directly against relativism, and not just the line of reasoning that usually brings us to it. So the objection just simply is that relativism permits really horrible things, things that seem universally morally wrong. So for instance, according to relativism, a culture that condoned a brutal practice of slavery would be morally right to continue that practice. So the antebellum United States, for example, was fully justified in practicing slavery since it was a part of their culture. They judged slavery to be morally appropriate, and so therefore it was morally appropriate, according to relativism. I think that this must be wrong. Slavery didn't become morally wrong once everyone agreed it was wrong. Rather, it was wrong the whole time, and it still would be wrong if it were practiced today. Cultures don't influence moral facts like this. Here's another example, female genital mutilation. It's a cultural practice of removing parts of young girls' genitals. It is often justified on the grounds that it makes the young women cleaner or more sexually pure and less prone to having sexual desire. Here, check this out for more information. What exactly is FGM? FGM is the non-medical practice that intentionally removes female genital organs. Often, girls are cut when they are still very young, in some cases, under the age of five. FGM is practiced all over the world, but is predominant in 30 countries. In some of those countries, high prevalence rates mean that nearly all girls still experience FGM. There are four types of FGM. Type 1, clitoridectomy, meaning removal of the clitoris. Type 2, excision, meaning removal of the clitoris and the labia. Type 3, infibulation, meaning a narrowing of the vaginal opening, sometimes through stitching. Type 4, all other harmful procedures not covered by the first three, including pricking, stretching, scraping, or even using acid to mutilate parts of the genitalia. Once more for everyone in the back, it is non-medical and has zero health benefits, but it can cause a lot of other things. Severe bleeding, complications in childbirth, problems urinating, problems menstruating, problems having sex, mental health issues, shock, death. More than 200 million women have undergone female genital mutilation, FGM, with three million more at risk every single year. FGM is violence against women and girls, child abuse, sexual assault. Often it's about controlling female sexuality, a tradition to prepare a woman for marriage, allegedly to purify them for their husbands. Sometimes it's done to girls because it was done to their mothers, as a rite of passage or a coming of age ritual, or even without much of an explanation at all. It's a cycle of social pressure that's hard to shake, but not impossible. Actually, many people in these countries want the practice to end forever. And though it is often shrouded in secrecy, many survivors told Global Citizen they wanted to talk about the reality of FGM so that they can help end it altogether. 
We should probably mention too, FGM is not a religious exercise. It happens in Christian, Muslim and Jewish communities, but there is nothing in any of their holy books that teaches it. Basically, FGM is violence against girls. So how can we end FGM forever? Education, teaching doctors and teachers what signs to look for and how to respond sensitively. Cultural intervention, survivors telling their stories to their own communities. Laws and policies, enforcing consequences when FGM is carried out and making policy changes that further deter the practice. The time to end FGM is now. Just head to globalcitizen.org forward slash FGM among us to find out more. I think it's pretty clear that FGM as a cultural practice is wrong. And even if it's judged by a large contingent of people not to be wrong, it causes needless suffering and its real purpose seems to be to control women's sexuality, something which I believe should be within their own right to control. Again, moral relativism can't condemn FGM as a practice, since it's a cultural practice and moral truths, according to relativism, come from cultural practices in this way. To my mind, this is a serious mark against relativism, and it's a mark in favor of an objective universal morality. Any moral theory that condones the abusing of young girls, just don't see how that could be a real moral theory at all. Let's go back to the Democrats and the Republicans and their debate about abortion to raise another objection to relativism. To my mind, this debate involves a substantive moral question for which there really is an answer. That is, abortion is either right or wrong. Of course, once we specify exactly what's going on in a particular case of abortion, and there really is a right or wrong answer about what our policies regarding abortion should be. So I think Republicans and Democrats really are disagreeing about something and not merely arguing about their preferences or their judgments or their attitudes. Relativism seems to trivialize all moral disagreements into disagreements over preferences or attitudes or beliefs. It's like one side is saying, chocolate ice cream is the best, and the other is saying, no, vanilla is the best. In that kind of a debate, there really is no substantive disagreement. One side just prefers chocolate, and the other just prefers vanilla. There's no such thing as one flavor being objectively better or the right flavor to enjoy. Since flavor is an intrinsically subjective phenomenon and things just taste differently, we enjoy different tastes differently. But morality isn't like that. Moral wrongs generally involve things like suffering, disrespect, the violation of rights and the curtailment of liberties, or subjugation. And those sorts of things seem to me to be perfectly objective and real phenomena. If I kill someone, I'm ending that person's conscious existence, depriving them of the opportunity to live the rest of their life and probably causing them a lot of pain and suffering in the process. Now, this actually brings us to a really important distinction because the kind of morality that I'm arguing for, the kind of theory of meta-ethics or theory of morality that I'm arguing for, does make moral truths in some sense dependent on subjective phenomena. Right? There is a kind of subjectivity involved uh, e when I kill someone, right? Suffering and pain, those are subjective phenomena, right? But they aren't subjective in the way that judgments or beliefs or attitudes or preferences are subjective. 
Moral relativism holds that moral truths depend on those kinds of subjective phenomena, but not things like pain and suffering, which are other kinds of subjective phenomena. So I think it makes morality depend on the wrong kinds of things. To make morality partly dependent on other kinds of subjective phenomena, like pain and suffering, seems to me totally right and unproblematic. And in some sense, it still forms a basis for an objective morality, right? If I stab someone, objectively speaking, that's going to cause them pain. That's a perfectly predictable and, I would argue, scientific result of the action of stabbing them. So even though I think that the, or at least part of the wrongness of stabbing the person depends on the pain that it's causing them, and even though that pain is a subjective phenomenon, I'm not arguing for a kind of relativism there, or I don't think I'm making morality depend problematically on the kinds of subjective phenomena that relativism does, right? So what I'm saying is that pain is something out there in the world that makes it wrong to cause. It's a feature of the world, uh, even though it's also a feature of our subjective experience. It's a feature of the world that can make certain actions wrong to carry out. And that's very different from what the relativist is saying. The relativist is saying what makes it wrong to do certain actions is a group or an individual's judgments or attitudes or cultural practices. So what I'm arguing for is really important to distinguish from relativism in that way. I think that a push for the value of tolerance tends to lead people in the relativist's direction. And this is admirable, since tolerance is no doubt a good thing. We should usually want to allow for other people and cultures to live that they want to live. But it's important to remember that relativism cannot provide a sound basis for tolerance, since according to relativism, intolerant cultures themselves should be intolerant, and only a universal morality could apply to and recommend a change of those intolerant cultures. Right, so if you think intolerant, if you think tolerance is important, you shouldn't be a relativist because cultures that don't believe that according to relativism would be justified. One last point about relativism. Very often you'll hear people say in modern discourse, well, this is just my truth, so it's true for me. Underlying these kinds of statements is a tacit assumption of some kind of relativism. The truth of whatever is in question is assumed to be relative to or dependent upon a particular individual, namely the speaker. But this is silly. Very few truths are dependent on us in this way. Imagine if I were to say to you, a person who believes, presumably, the earth to be round, that the earth is actually flat for me, and that it was just my truth that the earth was flat. Would that in fact make the earth flat for me? No. And you should look at me like I'm crazy if I say something like this since this is just not how truth generally works. There is a world out there, and the statements that accurately describe it are true, and the ones that don't are false. The world doesn't change based on the beliefs or the statements of a given person. There's not my truth or his truth 
There just is the truth, the way that the world is. So I hope that that adequately refutes relativism. Um, there are, of course, a lot more things to go into here. There are responses that the relativist, the relativist could make on his or her behalf. And then, of course, there are further objections to the view. But hopefully we'll talk about those in person or over Zoom. And at, at this point, I'd like to move on to the other kind of non-objectivist um, theory of morality. Uh, the one that uh, it also sort of falls in line with my earlier teenage skepticism. So this view, as I said, is called nihilism. Nihilism holds that moral, not that moral truths are subjective, but rather that they just don't exist. It holds that there are no moral truths. Moral statements, according to the nihilist, are like statements about witches or black magic. There simply are no such things as witches or black magic. And so many statements that use those concepts are just false. For instance, the witch living in Rush Ree's library made a potion and put it in my coffee mug. The term the witch in that sentence just fails to refer to anything. There is no witch living in the library because there are no witches anywhere in the world. In exactly the same way, a statement like murder is wrong just fails to refer. There is no property of wrongness anywhere in the world. So murder can't be wrong. Nor can it be right, according to the nihilist, since the world just contains no moral features at all on this view. Now, nihilism succumbs to some of the same objections as relativism. First, it permits really repugnant things, since nihilistic views would say there's nothing wrong with going on a mass murdering spree. For instance, take the Joker from the Batman films and comics. He apparently just wants to watch the world burn. What? <laughs> See, this is how crazy Batman's made Gotham. You know what I noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan. <laughs> Even if the plan is horrifying. He makes for great film because he's so messed up and interesting, psychologically disturbed. But part of the reason I think we're so fascinated with a character like the Joker is that he's doing things that are so almost unimaginably horrific. Blowing up a hospital, for instance. Now, what's really crazy about nihilism is that according to the nihilist, there are no reasons for the Joker not to do the things that he does, since there are no moral reasons at all, according to the nihilist. There, in fact, might be strong reasons in favor of the Joker doing those horrific things, since it might gratify his whims and his desires and his really disturbed states of mind. But normally we think that moral reasons override those sorts of desires and make it 
totally unjustified to do those sorts of acts. The nihilist can't say that. Now, let's think again about moral disagreement. Moral disagreement on nihilism wouldn't be trivialized in the way that it is trivialized under moral relativism. That is, it wouldn't be merely a discussion of preferences or beliefs. Rather, moral disagreement would simply fail to be a disagreement about anything real. There'd be no fact of the matter out there in the world that would determine which side of the disagreement was right. For example, if two people disagree about the shape of the earth, there is a fact of the matter in the world that determines which side is right. The side who believes that the earth is round and not flat is correct because the shape of the earth really is round. But nihilism would say that two people disagreeing about a moral topic are like two people disagreeing about witches about whether witches have warts on their noses. There's no fact of the matter about whether witches have warts on their noses, since there are no witches. It would be a kind of empty debate, according to nihilism. And all moral disagreements would have that kind of structure. So this brings me to the ultimate reason for which I reject nihilism. I think that there are, quite simply and plainly, facts of the matter that determine the answers to moral questions. Is it wrong to torture someone for no reason? Yes, doing so will cause them great pain and suffering. It will serve no greater purpose. It's a failure to treat them with the respect and the dignity that they clearly deserve. Should a young child be given an anesthetic before a painful surgery? Should neo-Nazism be resisted? These are easy questions, and I think that they are easy because there are obvious facts about the world that we can point to to help us answer the questions. Causing a young child needless pain, if it can be avoided, is bad. Condemning an entire population like the Jews based on prejudice and misinformed views about them is bad. We should avoid these kinds of things. Those sorts of facts seem to me to be just as factual and just as scientific as our facts about the shape of the earth or the charge of an electron. And if the world contains these kinds of facts, then we can rest assured that nihilism and relativism are false. These facts would provide a basis for a universal and objective morality. They would provide a basis for what philosophers call moral realism. No. One final point. If moral realism is true, that is, if there are facts like the ones I'm speaking about, facts that determine what we morally ought to do, one worry that often comes up is whether these facts perfectly and fully dictate how we should live. That is, under moral realism, is there only one way of life that's morally acceptable? Must we all live identical and boring lives? No. Moral realism can recognize a plurality of goods in the world. Lots of different things can go into making a life great and morally acceptable. One way of thinking about this is to say that there may be a window of morally legitimate variation, which is a term that I first heard from Professor William Fitzpatrick. 
And the idea is that there's a set of different ways of living and acting in the world that are all morally acceptable. They're just different. Now, outside of the bounds of the window of morally legitimate variation are things like pointless torture, things like rape, that are always and everywhere morally wrong. But within the bounds of morally legitimate variation are all of the equally acceptable ways of setting up society and living a good life. Clearly, if moral facts are part of the world, there's a lot of different kinds of moral facts. There's a lot of different kinds of things that are objectively valuable. Athletic pursuits, artistic pursuits, intellectual pursuits, friends, family, nature, all of those things seem to me to be great candidates for incorporation into a good life. But it's of course perfectly okay if you can't incorporate all of them or if you choose to pursue some over others. So within this window of legitimate variation, we can all pursue deeply valuable, meaningful, and morally acceptable lives. It's just that outside of the window is what's morally off limits or unacceptable. So it's in this way that there can be an objective basis for morality that leaves open a variety of valuable ways of living. Don't forget to take a look at the questions for cogitation. That is food for thought. And I'll see you next time here on Philosophy Jam. Sweet little darlings. The pine barrens, hoagies, the scrapple and gardens. I can hear the seashore. Like a lady